welcome to Can I Just Say from Common Room Radio. I am Elizabeth Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. And we're talking about one of my favorite movies. I think it's one of your favorite movies too, right? <laughs> it is. Yeah. No, for almost as long as I can remember. Yes. Since it came out in 95, I was in fifth grade. So, yes. <laughs> I love that. It came out in 95. I was definitely an adult. <laughs> I was such a Marianne at the time that this came out. The Sense and Sensibility, uh, directed by Ang Lee, screenplay by Emma Thompson, is what we're discussing today. And the music in it, God, the costumes, the sweeping grandeur of the whole thing. I was in love. And I remember, it's so funny because I... I think I said before last week that I really, the, the person that I felt I identified with most was Eleanor, but I was so a Marianne at the time. So that's pretty funny, I think. That is funny. That's mm-hmm. really okay. We're gonna have to talk about that. I first want to go over our uh, our Jane Austen schedule real quickly. Yeah, let's do uh, it. So in our last episode, if someone has found us here, we talked about the book Sense and Sensibility with uh, the actress Louise Barnes, who we adore Mm. and uh, we are going to after this do two more sets we're going to do Pride and Prejudice an episode about the book and then an episode about adaptations and then we will do Emma an episode about the book and an episode about adaptations I know there are people out there who really want us to do other books we're going to do these three right now and then we may come back around right we may come back around to doing those other books really Jane Austen wrote great books. They're all great. Yeah. So I was going to say, I definitely am interested in persuasion. Um, right. What's the other? Is it Northanger Abbey? Is that the? I'm that not even certain. Definitely not one of my. That's like probably my least favorite. Okay. Um, but Mansfield Park, a lot Mansfield of people really Park. love. That's the other. Yeah. Yes. I have possibly slightly controversial feelings about Mansfield Park. Oh, interesting. <laughs> um, both book and adaptation. <laughs> Um, but I do love, <clears throat> excuse me, I do love persuasion. So um, I also wanted to welcome people from the Jane Austen Society. Thank you for spreading the word. Um, yes. I am, thanks to my aunt and uncle, I am a lifetime member. And uh, I love you all. And it's just, it's really, it's really great that uh, that you are listening to our totally inexpert, but very <laughs> ardent, <laughs> loving podcast about these yes. books. Uh, yeah, I also wanted to say, actually, uh, no, I won't say it. Never mind. Okay, I'll just sure. show it to you. Okay. <gasps> oh, I have gorgeous. not. I have not read it yet because it was. I knew it would make me cry. Yes, yeah, screenplay and diaries. Because yeah. this is when she was split from Kenneth Branagh and falling in love with her now husband who played Willoughby, correct? Oh, she's married to Willoughby? Spoilers for that book. Yes. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) All right. I guess now, I guess, (laughs) I guess now that I did all of that and I was going to cut this out of the podcast, I have to leave it in. So I'm going to tell everyone what I just showed (laughs) Elizabeth. (laughs) I'm so amused. <laughs> so, <laughs> hi, Neely, my Aunt Neely, who is also a lifetime member of Jane Austen Society and was, oh, shoot, I forgot to look up again the original, what her actual title was, Regional Coordinator, possibly for New York. Um, Neely gave me, a little while ago, the book that is Emma Thompson's Sense and Sensibility Screenplay and Diaries. That's amazing. And I have not been able to read it yet because I have been so distraught about Alan Rickman's death. So I just like couldn't really, I just, you know, it's like, yeah, I love him a lot. So it Mm -hmm. was just really, it was just really, I could, couldn't delve into a book. It's one thing to see movies, but somehow, I don't know, I just felt like reading a book that like talked about how wonderful he is a lot was going to make me really sad. Of course. Now I have to read it. And (laughs) I guess now... (laughs) Now I know of my yeah. Now spoiled for the I'm so on sorry. set romance. I love that though. I really, really <laughs> love that. That's that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's great. So yes, uh, I will uh, read that book. It looks like you also need to read that book. Yeah. No, I would love to. I didn't know that that it existed. That's gorgeous. Um, yeah. Another neat Jane Austen uh, Society and connection with our podcasting life is that Harriet Walter played an amazing role in Black Sails in season four. 
And I know that she spoke um, to the New York chapter of the Jane Austen Society. And I've just wow. heard, I didn't see that, but I've heard stories. And I just think that's pretty amazing. That is very cool. Because, yep. yeah, she's awesome. So good. <laughs> she's Gosh. so good. I know. This film is perfectly cast. I Truly. just don't think that they missed a mark anywhere. I think that the performances really elevate the book even. I don't know if you can say that, but they elevate my understanding of the richness of the characters. They really bring the characters to life in the way that adaptation is supposed to do, that film is supposed to do, and so often misses the mark. I just think that this movie nailed it. I agree, and we'll have to go through the characters. I agree. I agree in that I love the characterization by the actors. Yes. I sometimes think the casting was took characters and was way more generous to them, which is fun. Like I love that in the movie, but I they feel like part, were. right. Part of the adaptation was to be more generous towards characters that again, in, I love this movie. I enjoy it very much, mm-hmm. but I feel like sometimes we lose a little bit of the, sh- of the, the saltiness of yeah. the book and the sharp edges. Right. Sure. Um, which again, it's not like it's. I'm not saying that on a level of a movie adaptation where they like totally get it wrong. I just feel like there is a little bit. I, sharp edges is the right way to say it. Like sharp edges that I like that they're there right. in the book, and so it's like it's it's really a hard balancing act. I mean, yeah. okay, maybe we should just start talking about characters. I was going to start sure. with the sisters, but maybe we should start start with Edward. Because I think Edward is the character that benefits most. Benefits most. I would completely (laughs) agree that Edward is the character that benefits most. Yes. Uh, Hugh Grant playing Edward is so awkward and charming and darling. And you just want to hug him. You do. Right. (laughs) He's very lovely. And we talked for a while about, in the book, him just being... Uh, just a paper thin character like we, right. we just couldn't a paper thin character that goes then to quite obnoxious right at the end when he's talking about lucy Steele. so oh like, yes that's right right out of, out of nowhere he right. suddenly gets so right. salty we're like what is right who are you yeah right so it's just i mean i find that interesting i you know with death of the author and all, also jane austen long gone so we could never find mm-hmm. out what her attention was it's just i always found it interesting in the book that edward is um that there's basically this whole story about Eleanor keeping down these fe- strong feelings she has about this man that I never felt like deserved it. Yes. So I love in many ways that Edward is filled out. And I mean, given Emma Thompson gives him whole scenes that don't exist in the book that give that him. That is true. S- she kind of fan fictioned Edward a little bit for us, which I she- really appreciate. <laughs> And I love those scenes. The whole Atlas scene. The amazing. Atlas scene is the Atlas so scene is fantastic. Right. Exactly. Yes. yes. So no, like, I, I love that scene. I'm okay with that because I almost felt like if Jane Austen is being critical of Eleanor for feeling so strongly about a man who doesn't deserve it, I'm just not really sure if that, I'm not sure that was p- supposed to be part of the book. I'm wondering, but, yeah. But it feels like it to me when I read the book. I'm always like, why? Why him? Like, we're supposed to have this, right? Yeah. And so I like that the film made Edward, I mean, not just more sympathetic, but like downright wonderful. Yes. Um, yes. He also gives like that very subtle rebuke of Fanny about switching the rooms which also is not in the book yeah um, it's fantastic mm-hmm. right yeah so and I even just, just on the staircase where he says they've lost their father in their house and <sighs> their lives will never be the same God. yes yes yeah no, he's yeah i know i'm i'm totally okay with this one change like, it's funny this change it works for me i'm fine with it oh absolutely yeah no right. I, I love that change i think it, it, it adds a lovely layer of detail and warmth to edward right. yeah and right. we need that if especially well, if we want to celebrate as much as we do in the end because they really hang a lot on that the celebration of the wedding and the proposal of course is right. like, you know the strings uh, come in and it's such a big uh, deal so good and it's that would be very hard to be as excited about it with just oh she's not going to be an old maid it's right. actually oh she gets to be with this really truly right. wonderful man right right and so and i just want to say like when i'm being you know sounding slightly critical of it it 
I can exist in a space where I am at the same time enjoying an expansion of a character in a in an adaptation and at the same time understanding that it might change things about the book that I also loved. You know what I mean? Like yes. every once in a while, these things are just like a trade off that I'm willing to make because, you know, the book obviously still exists. Mm -hmm. Book, again, Book Edward, no prize. Not, really, not my favorite <laughs> part of the book. So it's not like I'm like, oh, I wish we had Book Edward. Right. But I'm just saying in a more general sense, when I talk about these things, like sometimes I can love the adaptation changes and also like part of me is a little bit like okay they kind of you know they're changing the overall message mm -hmm. and I don't I don't think Emma Thompson did that I really think that this adaptation like totally still stays with the core but again minus a few sharp edges you're right mm -hmm. um so let's talk about because this was something that was really interesting to me um in our discussion of the book is that you were not so happy about Colonel Brandon and Marianne at the end. Right. And and I was saying like that is kind of how generally Jane Austen books happen. It's like you just kind of go, okay, and they married, wrapped up with a bow, right. we should be happy. And happy you're like, okay, rather. right. I believe you narrator because you told me that, but I don't feel like that was developed. Like do you feel like the the understanding of how Colonel Brandon might actually make Marianne happy is better shown in the film i mean it is it is better shown yes um i quite i mean i love seeing him read to her in the garden and the presentation of the piano at the house those two things are lovely and the you know in the language that we use that he does absolutely he sees her he understands what makes her special and unique he has no desire to change her at all um and that is shown more that is shown in the film in a way that is Actually, it's actually quite the opposite, I feel like, in the book, because it does say that she she changed. She learned to right. make herself happy with these things. And what was it that it said? Just about, like, she learned how running a house could... Right. Yes. I running think. a house, being, like, you know, the center of a community, stuff like that. Yes, like, the stuff exactly. that you would in that, in that, um, <clears throat> in that class and socioeconomic position that right. would have been her role and she didn't know how to love by have so therefore she loved him wholly and okay <laughs> but yeah that's all just we have to take the the narrator's word for it and i do like that we, we get to see the growing affection between them in the end of the film quite beautifully and of course when he first comes in the door and sees her playing the piano you really see the love at first sight there. I mean, and and so does Eleanor, which is lovely. I, I, I know. like how she looks up and sees and oh, oh, oh. Pretty much throughout the film, it's really, I mean, this is, it's so, I mean, Emma Thompson, we just, she deserves all She's the accolades. Like, because she adapted. So incredible. And, you know, and then, but the thing I'm about to say is more about direction and acting, but her, like, you can gauge so much of what's going on with in the room by watching Eleanor's reactions just these yes. subtle subtle and I love it and for me after all the talk we had of the narrator it almost felt like um is that somehow the two of them Emma Thompson and Ang Lee managed to wordlessly make Eleanor's character the embodiment of the narrator in a way that's so mm. interesting mm -hmm. I mean I'm sure some of the lines ended up but I don't think so I think Eleanor mostly had Eleanor's lines but it was through all these subtle cues of her expression and her and her your body language and that's how the narrator ended up being in the film and yes it's so subtle and so beautiful. And there are a few moments of that. So that moment, the love at first sight one, for me, it was the reading where Edward, and I want to go back to the reading with Brandon. Oh. I, I am still want to talk about Marianne and Brandon, but yes, I'm going to get back of there. Course. So when I love it, because in the book, we hear Marianne's censure of the way that Edward reads. Mm -hmm. But the scene is so, I mean, there's just all these moments where it's just like, this is what adaptation for. This is what a visual medium is for, is to take the text and just just fill it with richness that's yes. giving us more understanding. Mm -hmm. So that scene's amazing because I love that they chose to have Marianne actually correct him and like take over the reading. Yes. 
And I love <laughs> Eleanor's looks because her looks for both of them are full of such amusement and generosity yes. and love. Like she's so amused by how bad Edward is. And then that's it. Her look when Edward's reading so poorly makes you understand how Eleanor can love him. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then when Marianne takes the book and is just being absurdly dramatic. <laughs> yes. Just her reading is just as bad as his. Yes. Just in the, just opposite, the opposite direction. direction. <laughs> it was such a great choice. I love it. Yes. I love that they inserted how Marianne actually thinks it should be done because yes. it's so bad. Uh -huh. So like Marianne's just like, let me just say, I mean, it's just, I love it. It's really good. It's very it's, hysterical. Yeah, that's a great scene. And then when he, his second pass at it right. is brilliant. That is just, <laughs> oh my God, God. I know, I know. It's I know. so it's funny. Talk about moments where you just, Comedic do you want to just like, you just want to fold him up in your pocket and hold him forever and just be like, <laughs> it's okay, Edward. Not everyone's good at this. <laughs> but again, Eleanor's looks throughout are so good. And they're equal. Like that I love too. Like I felt like the level of amusement for both. And that was the cue that we needed to understand that Edward's reading is god awful and Marianne's reading is also god awful. And mm -hmm. that's what makes Eleanor love them both because the way they read is them. <sighs> and she loves them. Yes. And I just, it's perfect. It is just literally, it's just perfection in a scene. <laughs> yeah, th that's a wonderful one. It's so good. Um, okay, but wait, I want—I do want to go back to Colonel Brandon for me. Okay. I mean, again, Alan Rickman. So what I love, and I realized, I'm real. I realized in this last watch, like part of our conversation, where I feel, I feel like sometimes your your analysis of Book Willoughby was like super informed by movie yes. Willoughby. Yes, and it was my, very difficult not to have it be. Right. Yes, right. And my discussion of Book Brandon was very much informed by movie Brandon. Oh, but I think I do believe the stuff's in there in the book. Like, but I feel like what Alan Rickman did so beautifully is that he managed to show a person who is so beaten down and restrained, uh, like restraining himself. Mm. But you can see the once romantic person who was underneath there, who was being held back because of heartbreak. Yes, that is true. I do think it's there in the book because he tells the story of his love, but that's it. Mm -hmm. That's all we get is the story of his love. And then the reading. I mean, that's, I love that we have this reading threesome. Like we have the Edward and Marianne thing. And then we have the, the Marianne and I think might be yes. what you're looking for. Yeah, I still <laughs> I still don't quite understand, understand like, really the whole good. concept of three beats. So I was like, should I say it? No, because I don't really still, I still don't 100% still get that concept. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yes. Totally edited myself in real time very awkwardly. Um, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Reading threesome. Yes. Um, Hashtag. <laughs> Let me expose all the ways in which I was never trained to do these discussions. Um <laughs> My training was just being obsessed with reading. That's great training. And watching films. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so I love that we have, you know, the one we just discussed. And then we have also added in was the Marianne and Willoughby, which was lovely. Yes. I mean, I with love, the sonnets. yeah, I yes. love the two of them, like, you know, kind of working through it and trying to be generous to each other, but also trying to like show off to each other. Like yes. that was really very lovely perfectly done again yeah and then and then I'm really happy that we had the one with Colonel Brandon at the end because mm -hmm. in a way his reading is the most beautiful to me like I really loved the way he read because it wasn't showy mm -hmm. it wasn't awkward and it was very subtly heartfelt yes that's exactly right yeah very soulful yeah and so that's and, you know, and Marianne in both book and film goes through a transformation. I mean, I think it just what it the message I get in the film version is not that she changed herself to be his wife, but that she changed herself because of experience. Right. And at the end, it turns out that they were actually a good match. Mm hmm. And that's a very Which different makes message. makes sense, I think, for me so much because in both the book and in the movie, we see how well Brandon and Eleanor get along. 
Yes. And that really helps me to understand the relationship with Marianne because, of course, they depend on each other so much and have most of the time, I think, a pretty wonderful relationship. Although we'll have to get back to that when we talk about all the sister stuff. Yes. Actually, it's funny. That's where I wanted to start. But <laughs> so let's, let's go there now. Let's let's go okay. to this or or we could. Spin, no, well, let's do Willoughby after. Let's let's talk about the sisters. Let's talk okay. about how we feel with the sister discussion we had of the book. I mean, many things, but the thing that I really personally wanted to take into my viewing of the film from from the basis of the discussion we had and I'm not sure if we ended up like totally agreeing I don't remember exactly like where we ended up was this idea of like does the book or the narrator who you know however we want to define it um kind of favor one sister's right you know, life choices. Worldview, Not sure. exactly, because I mean, I definitely come down on the sisters aren't actually that different. It's just how they choose to show their level of sensibility mm-hmm. to the world. And so I felt, I remember that I, well, I've always felt that the book falls a little bit more on the side of like Eleanor as the person. Like they both have to change and they both do. They both have right. very extreme experiences and they both are. Um, in many ways, kind of two halves of a whole. And mm-hmm. I feel like, you know, the center kind of shifts closer to center by the end, like that they they both learn from the way the other one is. But I do feel like the book values uh, Eleanor's sense of decorum a little bit more than than Marianne's sense of like, I don't care what the world sees, like I am just me and I will express myself. Yes. Um, so I'm I don't remember exactly where you stood on what you think the outlook of the book is. And I'm also curious where you think the film lies in terms of favoring one of them over the other, if it does. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I, I do think the book was a little bit more in Eleanor's favor, but not much. Um, I, I think that it that it did try to show that there was virtue in both ways of of being certainly and that there was uh potential particularly potential for other people to be hurt in the ways that both sisters chose to express or not express Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. their their feelings and their their sentiment in the movie i think it is pretty clear that eleanor is the heroine i think that she almost saves Marianne a few times. Mm -hmm. Um, We get the sense that Marianne would not make it without Eleanor in a way that Eleanor would always make it on her own, even though she has the line, I cannot live without you. Right. I don't think that we really believe that um, watching. It seems to me that Eleanor is presented very much as the stronger and wiser and more capable of the two sisters. Okay. So I have a, I have a follow-up question for that. Okay. I agree with you in many ways. I think today I decided when I rewatched this morning, I decided Mm -hmm. that maybe that's less of a moral judgment and just that um, the adaptation has made Eleanor more the protagonist. But I feel like the the movie is actually very subtly and beautifully critical of Eleanor at the same time. And there's one visual moment for me that really is that. So there's interesting right after Willoughby rushes off, you know, like doesn't break the engagement because there was none. But, you know, after Mm -hmm. that moment when they all thought he was going to propose to Marianne and he rushes off, the mother and the both sisters, you know, they have that moment where where Eleanor's trying to comfort everyone. Everyone runs off crying into a separate room and slams a door. And then you have Eleanor with the tea that she was bringing for Marianne. Uh And she just sits down on the stairwell and you see her from above just sitting alone on the stairwell and she decides to drink the tea. Mm -hmm. For me, that was the perfect visual representation of the thing that you really focused on the book, which is that, you know, you could just say Eleanor's strong, but that's also isolating for her and hurtful for others because she didn't give them the opportunity. Like then they're all ultimately surprised by the pain she's been in all along and her mother and her sister are then pained by that. Mm-hmm. Like not materially hurt by it, but right, but not given the opportunity to be the family members that they want to be for her. Right. So, so now I'm starting to think that actually, perhaps the film does not think one of them has a better life approach than the other. I think I feel like the film really wants them to meet in the middle in terms of how they behave, 
but it's just perhaps that Eleanor, again, also because I do think she's kind of, she kind of absorbed the narrator role. Mm -hmm. So she's really the protagonist and Marianne is, is a less primary character than she was in the book. That is certainly true. Eleanor is the protagonist of the book as well, but I feel like there was more of that even in the film version. No, I would agree. I I'm thinking about that scene with Eleanor and the tea because I've always seen that very differently. I think. Oh, she interesting. Never, she never looked isolated to me. It felt much more like the scenes we get so often in Pride and Prejudice with Elizabeth and all mm -hmm. of her family being silly around her. Right. While she is like the, the only one who's keeping her head together. So it seemed to me uh, to be. Right. I mean, they're two halves her... of the same coin, but yeah. Right, right. So it seemed to me to, to again be pointing to the strength of Eleanor, not to her isolation. Um, and then I think the other scene where I feel like we give Eleanor the most credit surprised me because I saw just this last time that I watched it, that I think it reads differently than I thought, which is when they're, the sisters are both in London mm -hmm. and Marianne has just found out mm -hmm. about Edward being engaged to Lucy and she is trying to connect with Eleanor Yeah, and Eleanor pushes back, um, in what I had always seen previously, but again, it shifted for me this last time. I'd always seen previously in a now she's finally free to express how she has been feeling all this time and that Marianne empathizes with her and weeps for her because that's what Marianne does. But looking at the scene this last time, I didn't get that. I got that Eleanor is angry with Marianne for being yeah. so focused on herself, which is also part of it. Like that was always part of it. Mm -hmm. but But it comes out that she lashes out at Marianne, and then I see Marianne crying because her feelings are hurt, not because she's actually caring about what has happened to Eleanor, mm. which is really a disservice to the character of Marianne, I think. Marianne was very right. moved by the jilting, if you will, of yeah, Eleanor. Yeah, absolutely. She was very moved by that in the book. And in this scene, I see that kind of like that sigh from Eleanor as she goes to comfort Marianne and she hugs her and she, right. there's no warmth there. There's no connection no. there at all right. because she's still angry because now she's feeling and now I'm over here comforting you again because now your feelings are hurt and there's no room for my feelings in this relationship, which is a choice that certainly is accurate for the earlier part of their relationship. But I think in this moment in the book, we have a pretty strong shift where Marianne comes to the aid of her sister, where right. she just empathizes because that's who hmm. she is. She's so full of compassion and empathy. I th so they moved that shift to when she got sick. To when she got well, when, after right. she almost exactly. died. Right, right, right. Yeah. right, exactly. Huh. I mean, again, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. I totally agree with you. This might also be a function of making the story more about Eleanor because that right. when you did that, Precisely. like that shift makes it more because I mean, it's it's the way they did it really illuminates how Eleanor's choice to not disclose stuff and not show her emotions and always be correct is so damaging to herself. Yes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I mean, again, very noble also. <laughs> she does keep her word we do need she to get to keep her word. we do that's one of my that's my my favorite question maybe I'm we should very I'm, interested to talk about lucy yes yes my favorite question because you did actually ask while we were talking about the book you were like you asked you're like didn't quite remember how you perceived lucy Steele and mm -hmm. whether the deviousness that we see in her approach to eleanor in the book whether that is shown in the film Mm -hmm. Where do you come down on that? I, uh, barely. If you know to look for it, I think you see it there. But otherwise, oh. I think what you see is someone who is self-absorbed, um, jealous, but not malicious. I, I do not see malice in this version wow, of Lucy Steele. I totally do. That's so interesting. And maybe because, I mean, again, of course, I know it's there. I knew it's there. I knew it was there when I first saw the film. And that's so interesting. This is the right. fascinating thing to me about it. I mean, and it's so subtle. It's so, and that's what I love about it is it's so subtle because. It is so subtle. Again, if you know about it in the book, it's there. But I yeah. think if you don't. She could see her as just an innocent. Not innocent. She's definitely emotionally manipulative. 
Mm-hmm. She's definitely jealous. She's definitely very self-centered and flighty. Mm-hmm. But I don't see malice. Like, mm. I don't see her purposefully trying to hurt, to hurt Eleanor. Eleanor in the process. Right. Like, I-, I think it's more that she doesn't care whether or not she hurts her. And she also wants to just be sure that she asserts her position. Right. No, no, no. You can't have him. I have him. But that's different from... And I'm going to make you squirm and uncomfortable and cry yourself to sleep at night while I gloat. Right. Yeah. See, I think, yeah, it must be book like that. I came from book to film. Mm. It must be because, yeah, even in the beginning when she says to Eleanor, like, you know, well, if he had I'm a jealous person. And had he talked about one woman more than others when she had just said to Eleanor, he talked but, to you the whole time. He spoke exactly, so exactly. So there are clues, and also oh, just yeah. yeah, the subtle eye shifts, just like when she'll say something and then look for Eleanor's reaction. Yeah. So it's there, but you're right. No, it, it is probably. There. Oh, I don't. I don't know how. I, like, do I? Would I have wanted it to be less subtle? Is it better that it's? I have no idea. I mean, like, part of me loves that it's subtle because I said this when we talked about the book. Like, part of what I love about Jane Austen is that she allows her female characters to be complex enough to be unsavory in mm-hmm. ways that I feel like a lot of writers are uncomfortable with, that that female characters have to be either very good or very bad, but just these, these very culturally feminine coded ways that women are vicious to each other mm-hmm. is, uh, I mean, you know, I don't enjoy, I don't like those things, right. but I love having them show up in stories because they are so real and they are so much part of um, a woman's experience. Again, I'll make it clear to everyone. I, this is not a gender essentialist argument. It's just I've always believed that part of why women have found these subtle ways to undercut each other is because people generally, when they lack power will find other ways to create, right. you know, hierarchies yes. when everyone has less power. But yes. these subtle ways create a hierarchy within the hierarchy. So I've always loved how Jane Austen does that, how mm-hmm. she really shows those characters and and really just so perfectly exposes the way it actually happens in ways that people who've never experienced it, largely men, wouldn't even necessarily be aware that it's happening. Right. So I just, I feel very seen, not that I'm that person or I hope not to be that person, but I feel very uh-huh. seen when an author actually really depicts that well, because we've all had it. I mean, even if it was just in middle school, yeah. we've all had that. We've had a Lucy Steele in our life. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and maybe at some point we were kind of a Lucy Steele because none of us are perfect. And that's right. also, yeah. that's also very important. Like it's really important for us to see ourselves also in the less complimentary characters because mm-hmm. it's part of human experience. Right. I mean, wow. you know, if you think about it a little, I mean, you can have sympathy for Lucy Steele. Absolutely. And again, in the adaptation, especially right. in the book, I don't know if I can. She's really pretty awful and malicious in the book. She is pretty awful and malicious. But again, she's a person that doesn't have means. She has no power, no means. And I'm not that saying like, I'm not saying she's wonderful. Uh, no, like she doesn't, no. she doesn't stand up well next to Eleanor, but that doesn't, but I can still have sympathy for her. That's funny. This is usually your job to have sympathy for, <laughs> care, for despicable characters. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> but you're I do right. have sympathy for her because she Maybe lived. Maybe that's why, I mean, because you're taking the brunt of it since somebody is having sympathy. I don't feel like. Right. <laughs> right. <I have> to. <laughs> Oh, God, you've got this one. Yeah, exactly. Good. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I'm your Eleanor and you can be like you can be all Marianne and judgmental about be her Marianne because I'm like, because I'll be like, is like, no, no, no we hate her. Oh, let's great. temper. Yeah, we're going to temper our judgment of her. No, but I do have some. Oh. She's she's a girl who grew up with no means, who fell in love young. I'm going to guess that she probably did fall in love with him, that it wasn't just. But who knows? OK, that's true. There's a reading of of Lucy Steele where she was just wanted Edward for his money. I'm going to choose to think that she maybe fell in love with him young. And this has been, you know, kind of an uncomfortable period in her life. But, you know, I could sure. be wrong. She could just be god awful. I don't know. Also I, an option. Struck, she just strikes me as someone who is tenacious. She is just a dog with a bone. Yeah. Yeah. And she, uh, Edward, <laughs> willing is hers. to willing to get a bigger bone when, when it shows right, up. <laughs> when it comes down to it. But but she's just so fixated in because she could have, I'm certain at any point, 
she could have settled on somebody else besides Edward. But she's entitled is the word. She has this mm. weird sense of entitlement, mm. which is especially strange for somebody without any power. Well, M- maybe except- because, again, this was her ticket. Like, this was her right. golden ticket. Well, also, I mean, in that world, again, we talked about this in the book. A man asking a woman to marry him and then having constancy and not reneging was really the only power women who had no power and especially ones who had no money right. had afforded to them. Like oh, there was this oh, one awful. thing, the society sucked mm-hmm. in relation to women, but had a few things about honor that were, that basically existed to protect women. And one yeah. of those was that if a man proposes, he, he's true to his word or somebody right, he, duels him with a sword. Yeah. Right, he <laughs> has to follow through with it because uh-huh. the minute he proposes or even, you know, in case like Marianne and Willoughby, when it looks looks like they're engaged, that's it. Like that woman's spoken for. No one else is right. going to try to court her. So if he doesn't follow through, he's basically ruined her. Right. Financially. I'm not mm-hmm. talking about sex and stuff. I'm not talking about like reputations. I'm just saying financially, it is a contract. Yeah. And it is a contract. You know, again, I am a feminist and feminism talks about the contract of marriage and how this hurts women. But there were aspects of it because women were so disenfranchised in every other way. There were aspects of that contract and the honor that was that men were supposed to follow this code that did protect women in this small way within a structure that really afforded them very little protection. <laughs> All right, let's talk about Willoughby then. <laughs> I was say, let's move on from Lucy Steele. On that note. <laughs> Willoughby. You see now why I gave Willoughby so much credit throughout the whole oh, reading. No, no, I know. I know. Yeah. I know movie Willoughby. He's delightful. He is so lovely and wonderful. Yeah, and that makes him even more of a shit. Yep. <laughs> Like, ultimately, when you really yep. look at it, that mm-hmm. makes him worse. I mean, look at his I whole wish, thing. He's I wish such we had a... gotten that scene where he comes back to the house and talks to her in the, in the, in the drawing room during that storm. Yeah. I wish we had that. I would have loved to see yes. that exchange between those actors, if nothing else. Right. Well, and that actually, that was the scene, the missing scene that made me say that in some ways, the uh, the male characters got more depth, but in some ways they were kind of flattened out too. Well, he was in yes, particular, maybe. I think he's that such a fantastic actor. I feel like even though I want that scene, mm-hmm. I feel like we got all of it between his just his facial expression. Yeah, I when know he's so good. They see him at when she when she calls out to him at the ball, and he's yep. with the woman that I know. he's with. Yeah, and just his face goes white. And that little scene they give him on top of the hill looking down. Yep. Which no, and also, yeah, the, the on scene the on the top day, of the hill. Right? right. Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Um, no, and also the scene where he leaves them, where he's just so conflicted yes. when he leaves them. Yeah. No, you're right. I think you're right. That does, that did get expressed. Um, I also, the aspect of it that it, it's like, I talked about this when we talked about the book. I talked about it last night when we were doing the question and answer with our with our patrons. Um, I love when a story doesn't manipulate me. I don't like when stories manipulate me, but I like when a story takes me emotionally down a road where I will look back and realize I made the same mistakes as the characters. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And movie will it be like when you, I mean, I've watched this. We both, it sounds like watched this movie a lot of times, several times, times. dozens of times. Yes. But it's definitely his performance is one where you could, if you were watching this for the first time, be completely swept up and oh, completely course. believe him and want nothing in the world more for him, for Marianne than him. And then you rewatch and you're like, oh, look at him. Isn't he a yeah. player? Mm-hmm. Isn't he good at this? You know, yeah. just the whole thing with the flowers where like his first reaction was Very like, oh, showy. some someone brought fancier flowers. But he like, but he like totally just you know caught up with himself and was like oh well let me take this angle that I knew that this was the kind like you know he picked those flowers just because he thought about it the last minute yeah exactly you know that on his way that is like, oh flowers though too. right yeah exactly pretty. and yeah. then he Ugh. made this about this essential like him having this essential understanding of Marianne mm-hmm. and not because like there were some flowers next to the road it's like right. dude is a player he yeah. knows how to do this he knows how to just make a woman love him yeah and it's so obvious to me when you rewatch it, 
how much it's about wanting to be adored. Yes, absolutely. And just enjoying his summer. Right. And and this little flirtation and romance adding to his enjoyment of his idyllic country day. Right. Oh, I mean, I do, I do girl. believe he fell in love with her as much sure. as he's capable of love. But I do also believe that Willoughby Just is a person who loves too. being loved. He yeah. loves being loved. He loves having a reflection of himself that mm. is, yeah, sorry. No, no, I think that's, I think that's fair. And it's not even necessarily always villainous no it was for him because especially because of the time period like right. willoughby to modern day willoughby yeah he's no, just I like mean, a he's a kind of narcissistic Probably dude has three right. or four marriages but you know other than that maybe never got married maybe has like whatever kind right. of a narcissistic yeah. dude yeah exactly kind of a narcissistic dude but but Probably. like a hell of a lot of fun Yes, I would think that the women, I, I imagine like a Sex in the City style brunch date of women who have been Willoughby's lovers of the years being like, oh, but this though, wasn't it <laughs> oh fun? My you know? Oh my God. Oh my God. I want that now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but back to the whole thing of honor that in a world where women are disenfranchised, being that guy is despicable. Mm hmm. Oh, absolutely. No, in this because world, he's he is actively he is endangering he is women. Right. Yes. No, there. I, you're right. I, I argued for Willoughby as much as I could when we <laughs> read the book. But you absolutely did convince me that there's no there is no redeeming him in that world. There just isn't. Right. And that's not to take away agency from the women. Women make mistakes and have consequences True. for their mistakes. But that doesn't absolve him right. of his part in it. Yes, and he was the one with the power, and that gives him more responsibility. Right. right. Just, I mean, he did end up having financial consequences, but only because he got caught. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. He he could have had some baby off somewhere with... with I like that they made her Beth here, so that like, we could differentiate between... Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And married Marianne and had his aunt never found out about it, he would have gotten away and and continued to be a privileged person with a huge income throughout mm -hmm. he was he did essentially endanger himself again there's also the whole thing with the debts i don't remember if that's in the book but that's another argument against why marianne would have been ha would not have been happy with him right like it sounds like his inheritance was going to be huge so maybe it would have never touched her but like he's not just he's not just irresponsible about women like he is painted, at least here, as generally irresponsible yes. in a way that could be harmful for his wife on many Absolutely levels. Absolutely so. No, I think that that's completely fair. Can we talk about Miss Jennings? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love Miss Jennings start to finish in this. So in the book, we get a little bit more. Well, like, I see why she's tiresome. I I. I oh, totally. totally see why she is tiresome. Like, I get this. But we don't get that same feeling of her being a malicious gossip. The girls think right. that she was a malice, malicious gossip in the beginning. I think because uh, of the we way We do she have the whole F note thing. I don't remember if it was her who said that or Sir John. Yes, but like, the F in the major, beginning. Well, yes, no, right. It's so playful. It's just like it is gossipy, but it's not malicious gossip or uh, again remember we have the line in the book where um marianne says does she really have any interest us, I any interest in us at all or is she just right. here for juicy gossip right but i think that there's no, no she's wonderful that she doesn't adore them from the jump as soon as they got yeah. out of the carriage they're so thrilled and so happy to just have neighbors and i love mrs jennings yes again i, I do too i don't want her to be my neighbor but i don't think that there's a malicious bone in her body or that she can be mistaken as such in this adaptation. Right. I mean, and right. watching her in a film is about the perfect dose of Mrs. Yes. Jennings. Yeah. No, again, I do not want her to be my neighbor. Please right. do not misunderstand. Those people are, are challenging to have in your life. Right. But I thought that she was about as delightful a portrayal as Miss Jennings could be. Well, and her and Sir John, I just, I loved like this whole when they arrive and it's just like, you're just like a wall of noise and chaos just yes. arrived in All their the lives. Dogs running around their feet. <laughs> it was so, it was it's great. Perfect. It was great. Yes. Uh, I was a little sad not to have Lady Middleton, honestly, um, yeah, because that is an I interesting do. Choice. Yeah, because we don't have, again, 
Jane Austen is so good at showing us a wide spectrum of the way women can be in the society. Right. And we really don't have that version at we all. Even though right. she's tiny in the book, uh, we don't have that woman who's like too reserved, but not bad. Just like mm -hmm. a benevolent, way too reserved person. Or not benevolent, like a neutral. She's a neutral. neutral. Sure. Mm -hmm. And we don't think we have, I don't feel like we have any neutrals in the film. It's fine. It's not a big deal. Yeah, I think it's that's just, fair. I do feel like you, it's almost like she, like a, a few neutral characters give you a baseline because I feel like here the the that is the one thing. Like I feel like the characters are nuanced, yes, but also like we know our camps. We know who our good guys are and who our mm -hmm. bad guys are, and it's very clear. And there's no having a few neutrals thrown in there kind of gives you a little bit more of a range. Yeah, like there was no way. I mean, I mean again, Fanny amazing perfect like perfect. spot on Awful. perfect yes, yes. Uh, insidious the worst i also love that we started with the promise like the yes, film the very made beginning. it very clear like that was another discussion we had about whether right. their brother was you know how how bad we were supposed to take him and i i see no redeeming qualities in no, him it's true um and i do love that the film really just straight off tells you that because you start mm -hmm. with the promise and then watching him break it. And that's how you start the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that was a very strong choice. And to see him at first saying, okay, determined to do the right thing. And just how quickly he's like, oh, but if I, no, no, you're right. No, I don't have to. No, I definitely don't have to. No, I definitely don't have to. It was right. pretty despicable. Yeah. Well, and then you have that lovely moment when, when he does recommend that they take the sisters into their house and then, Fanny makes this whole thing. Of, oh, no, it wasn't that. It was when they were gossiping about Marianne and Willoughby. And and Fanny actually says, oh, well, you know, Miss Gray, right? It's Gray. Miss Gray, Gray. Mm -hmm. has all this money. And, you know, Marianne has nothing. <sighs> and this is just fodder for their gossip at this point. It's like, Gross. you did this. Oh, you are I part of together, this. together, but you're so right. Right? Wow. <sighs> yeah. I love it. Oh. I love it. So good. So fun. <laughs> and of course, she and Lucy Steele just hit it off swimmingly until they're at odds with each other. I know. Well, see, that scene also was amazing where Lucy's like, well, but I have no money. And she's like, oh, that'll be fine until yeah. it's my brother. Exactly. <laughs> Ooh. I love it. I love it all. Uh, that's <laughs> yeah, they're just yeah, there just really is just like a list of moments where I just like, I love this. I love this. I love this. It's just so good. Speaking of, can we talk about Hugh Laurie? Yes. <laughs> he is See, so we're just delightful. not even going to make it to favorite things because he was going to be my favorite thing. Oh, so I'm just saying it now, sure. even He's, though that's not our format. Is, I can't remember the character's name now. Mr. Palmer. Palmer. That's it. Right. Mr. Palmer. Oh, my gosh. Is he hysterical? But I love that he also gives us those really beautiful human moments. Yep. He, has, he shows some real kindness and graciousness to Eleanor. And I just he's perfect. I mean, I think that that's somewhat to the expense of his wife. I mean, and, and yeah. again, I talked about this in the book. This is she one of Jane Austen's mind. favorite thing is, you know, the like the like prickly man and the silly woman married mm -hmm. to each other. That is super We'll, we'll see an expansion of that in Pride and Prejudice. Uh -huh. <laughs> that will become central to the story. <laughs> I have trouble um, with that. I really do. But we'll we talk will. About it. Well, there's a lot to. I mean, that there's is so a, that's a huge part that. of that's a huge part of the story of Pride and Prejudice. And mm -hmm. yeah, and then I like it that they be they start out in Sense and Sensibility, which is chronologically before Pride and Prejudice. Uh -huh. That 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 combination starts out as a punchline. I mean, brought to much higher comic effect in the film mm -hmm. even than in the book but i love that it starts out as a bit of a punchline in this book and then becomes a central place of criticism in the next book so preview preview of my okay. thoughts about pride and prejudice good uh, excellent okay yeah so that's going to be I'm really fun to, to talk, talk about, about with you yes it will be mm -hmm. um <clears throat> so yes i know it's so good but he does i Right. That note of concern at the end and that bit of chivalry that he has at the end is so not in the book. And I, yeah, I'm, I am quite happy it's there. It's there is something really beautiful about it. Mm -hmm. And again, it, it shows up as a condemnation, a further condemnation of Willoughby for me. Now, that's interesting. Like even this dude, even this dude who basically can't give a shit about them can actually have 
a huge amount of of empathy for yeah. their plate when it when it's called for. And so the idea that like this random dude who's mostly just been annoyed by their presence sure. can show such concern and chivalry compared to the guy who, you know, positioned himself in the center of their lives mm-hmm. can't. Um, I don't know. For me, that felt like, I don't know, maybe just I see everything as a condemnation of Willoughby. <laughs> Harsh. <laughs> But, Again, okay. I love him. I enjoy being swept away with them. Even now when, I, you know, even on rewatchings and I totally can see every move he's making and how manipulative it is. that great jacket right. billowing behind him as he rides. Brutal. Yeah. Oh, right. And can, yeah, can, hero. can we do need to talk about his romantic entrance, which is just spot on perfect. Also, like, so it's just it's just the language of period films. Yeah. Like, we totally like... We talked about Jane Eyre, like Rochester in the in the BBC adaptation gets the exact same entrance with the horse bucking and like, uh-huh. and I was just like, this has become the like a visual shorthand for we are now playing on the ideas of romance. Yeah, I mean, and again, I'm not talking about romance like man and woman romance. I'm talking about R, romance, romance literature. right? Romance, the romance, yes, romantic literature, like this idea that everything is about feelings and mm-hmm. strong emotions, and like that <laughs> is just that is just like literally become the shorthand for that. It's like mm-hmm. strong weather, dashing man on horse right. that bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and it also no but it also I mean it's it it's very interesting on a on a thematic level because it is it really shows um it's presenting masculinity as something that is both terrifying and completely enticing. It is yes. it is not just romantic because romance like small r romance. It's not just romantic because of you know a uh, a type of literature. It's romance, I think, because it's the female, it has an interesting aspect of the female gaze that it is, it exactly kind of embodies masculinity, I think, for young women is mm-hmm. that, you know, just the excitement and the fear at the same time. Right. Like a thunderstorm. Sure. Yep. Like a thunderstorm. Mm-hmm. Um, I like so, that. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I would love to know if anyone knows, please email us, tweet at us. I would love to know the first film or TV adaptation where this showed up because it is no joke. Like it has become shorthand. It is right. everywhere. It's you will be way see back the, there. Sure. I'm so curious. Like something, you know, some sort of bonnet film, basically. Um, which uh-huh. I say with all Bonnet the love in the film. world, I do yes. not say this. This what? is uh, God. Is that just my family shorthand? It I don't might know. be because I, I, I don't know. I was thinking of a director named Bonnet, and I was like, no, like, oh, no, wait, I get it, I get it. Sure, <laughs> that might be my family shorthand. Bonnet films. Uh, it are... makes sense because I called it what um, something with corsets. I guess is what right. I exactly. Saying. Movies with corsets. <laughs> right. Is, yes. Uh-huh. So you know, it has become really just almost a caricature of of things that happen in these films and again mm. i'm saying this with all the love in the world these are my favorite films i yeah, love them fabulous. um and i'm dying to know where it started like somebody because it's not in the books maybe it's is it in jane Eyre? and no, i don't even think it's a jane Eyre. there's definitely a horse and he the and horse he, and what i was just thinking right. about is oh maybe it does dog. bug right no many and no and he does uh, rochester hurts his ankle so maybe the bo- yes. horse does but no the so- horse the horse does yeah remember he says you spooked my horse to oh Jane. so maybe it is but Jane. they do maybe- also both have dogs i feel like this is interesting right. like th- that right the, 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 the wild pack right. dog that comes right. with them well and like the always, hunting like, motif hunting yeah all of it like that that being a part of wildness and wilderness and- oh no see now i don't remember if it's in the book like it if was. it was if it's in this book if it's in Sense and Sensibility, that predates Jane Eyre. Like I was going to say, maybe this is Charlotte Bronte's oh, contribution to womanhood. Yeah, sure. <laughs> one of her many, many, many contributions. But if it's in one of Jane Austen's books, then it actually predates. I don't think it is. I think he just rides up in in Sense and Sensibility. I don't have my copy on me just now, so I couldn't say. But that's right. an interesting question. Yeah. Uh, I will research. I'm going to in Pride and Prejudice. This does not show up in Pride and Prejudice. This is not part of the Pride and Prejudice visual or not really story language. Yeah, this this isn't really how Darcy rules. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right, because he's an honorable man. Stay tuned for that uh, argument. <laughs> oh.
Interesting. I just made uh, a lot of vowel sounds. Okay. Yep. Uh, sorry. Another preview for Pride and Prejudice mm -hmm. discussion. <laughs> I'm raring to go. Um, <laughs> oh, I've got to research this. I got to figure out how what what who started representing these romantic men in this way. I'm so curious because yeah, it for me it's so it's so perfect because Willoughby not in himself. Like I don't know if Willoughby really himself. Like it is impossible. I feel like to really know who Willoughby is because of this mirror thing. I feel like Willoughby. Yeah makes himself be the man that Marianne will adore. Sure. And I feel like that scene in the film is so perfectly done because he, you know, the storm and the bucking horse and the swooping her up, this is all, she didn't like tell us, us this story, but it is the story of romantic literature. Mm -hmm. We know, and definitely people then, when Jane Austen wrote this, like they know that this would be Marianne's ideal because yeah. she idealized that sense that not that sense, that style of, of sensibility of mm -hmm. this kind of passionate way of looking at life. So that's what I feel like that the scene is really, we're just seeing through Marianne's eyes, like almost like her dream. Even yes, if he didn't, absolutely. it didn't all play out that way. It's almost like, it's almost like we're seeing how had Marianne is seeing this story. Of exactly. How she would meet the love of her life. This is right. just how it would go. Mm -hmm. Right. And she had previewed it both in the book and in the film. She had previewed for us what she sees sure. as the ideal. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, one more thing that I wanted to bring up in this adaptation, which is going to be part of all of our talks about adaptations of Jane Austen is I love the use of dancing as a way to force people into conversations. Yes. I love this. It's mm -hmm. so good. It's also in the books, not in this book. I believe in Pride and Prejudice that ends up being part of the books as well. Um, but I love that, that Emma Thompson brought that into this book, that they mm -hmm. ended up dancing. And that's how Eleanor and Willoughby start talking to each other because the way the dancing was then, you would change partners all the time. Right. So. It was just, yeah, it's just a great, adap it's a great device to use in the adaptation mm -hmm. as a way. I always love those scenes too. Like they're, they're nice to read, but they are beautiful to watch. They are some of my favorite things that yes. happen in adaptation. Anytime yes. there's a ballroom scene, I'm just so thrilled. Yes, right. So there's just like the basic, well, and that's a great thing too. It's serving many purposes. There's just the basic like, this is lovely and I love looking at it and I will always uh -huh. love looking at it. And it also is really useful. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling um, in the time it was probably useful in that exact same way that it gave people these moments, you know, in a world where men and women were chaperoned and were in these larger groups of people all the time and not having I mean, you can see how Lucy Steele is like trying to subtly find ways to find private conversation time with Eleanor. Like this just wasn't a thing that people had access to even right. to women they kind of had to construct Just ways so to have private conversation time mm -hmm. and and men but men and women in particular and i have a feeling that this is something we see in the films that actually was true is that these moments of of being partnered in these dances where it really is just momentary um were opportunities for a very tiny snippet of semi-private conversation mm -hmm. yes and there were long dances, I suppose. In um, reading Pride and Prejudice, uh, Elizabeth is talking about how she has Mr. Darcy on her card for or, or it's it's two dances in a row, which right. is half an hour. Right. I'm like, oh my god, half an hour, two dances. <laughs> I'm tired just thinking about this. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, we do have to see. I mean, the Jane Austen Society does do these balls, I and I know that. I would love mm -hmm. to see that too. Yes. <laughs> um, and. Yeah, so I just I I just had to like bring that up. We are going to talk about that quite a bit in Pride and Prejudice, and I love that that Emma Thompson inserted that into into the story here. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautifully done. I'm ready to talk about favorite things if you are. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh gosh, favorite things. Mine are going to have to be really vague. I think. Oh no, I have so many, Daphne. I have so many. <laughs> just just tell me all of them. Stream of consciousness, favorite things. Uh, favorite things, first of all, it's so flippin' beautiful. Um, yes. It is just beautiful to behold and to listen to. The music is also gorgeous. Um, I love 
all of Edward's awkwardness so much. The Atlas scene, the stable scene, when he comes into the house and t- to visit Eleanor and... And Lucy's uh, there. Lucy is there. Oh my God. And he just sits the down blocking in the chair of that and he just scene. stands back up again. <laughs> The blocking is so good. The blocking's yeah. so good that he only sees Eleanor when he walks At in, first. and you have to see her struggle. Like she knows, she's like, she don't knows give knows what he's away. about to say. I yeah. Know. Oh, all of that is perfect. All of it is perfect. When he comes to the house again, and everybody's super awkward, and he sits on the knitting. Like it's oh, all. God. It's so good. Yes. Perfect. Everything with Edward is perfect, um, and that is all adaptive choice. I think I'll leave it there. Yeah, gosh, there's so much. I could go on okay. and on. The picnic with Colonel Brandon. I mean, everything. It's so good. It's so good. It's such a beautiful movie. Yeah, it is such a beautiful movie. Okay, Mr. Palmer was my favorite thing that I had prepared, <laughs> but we already talked about him. Um, no, my other favorite thing is the insertion of the humor among, in the family. Like the humor of just like this lovely amount of sarcastic wit that uh-huh. that Eleanor, that also, well, Okay. Oh, and we didn't talk about Margaret. I love Margaret. I just tweeted about Margaret's her. I love, really cute. I love Margaret. Yeah. I love Margaret's the sword thing. I love that she brings up pirates. Yes. Which is totally course, not Captain part Margaret. of the book. Right. Uh-huh. Totally not part of the book. Um, yes. For those of you who don't know, Elizabeth and I, <laughs> we podcasted for over a year about a, a show called Black Sails. We love pirates. Oh my God. That was our first Black Sails reference. That's yep. a new record. Yep. I know, right? Wow. Wow. I know. We talked about Louise Barnes, but we didn't say where she's from. She's from Black Sails. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That is a record in the opposite direction. <laughs> um, so yes, Margaret's amazing. And, but yeah, the humor, there's just these moments where like, where uh, Marianne doesn't want to change out of her wet clothes. And then she says, you, you will care when you're, when you your nose, care very much when your nose swells up. <laughs> and she's like, love that. Yeah. You know, I love like, this is even like a conversation from the book, but I just love the delivery where, where, uh, where Marianne talks about, Colonel Brandon's rheumatism and uh-huh. the mom says oh well if he's you know if he's decrepit or whatever she uses infirm. like I'm yeah. infirm I'm practically dead like just every bit and then right and then Eleanor says something like I can't believe you've lasted this they're just like all oh, the the it's a lot of fun the warmth you expected but like the cleverness that's what I think it is it's that it's yeah. that wonderful combination in a family of we know each other, we know how to, you know, be clever at one another because uh-huh. we know each other and love each other so well. And that's, that's just, yeah. that warmth just comes through in these minute moments in such a beautiful way that like no one has to tell us yes. how much these women love each other. And that's what makes the Atlas scene work so well. Right. It's because she doesn't know Edward, but they're able to do that same thing. She picks up on what he is putting down. Yes. And the two of them going back and forth. Uh, oh, for me, that's the moment she falls in love from. with him. <laughs> yes, of course. Who wouldn't? No, that's right. lovely. Seriously. Uh-huh. Like, right. Well, that he's, <laughs> that, you know, he just shows, right, again. This is movie Edward, not book Edward, not, yeah. but that he shows such insightfulness, like that he walks in and totally understands how to get Margaret. And they're all too distraught to do that. I mean, I, I, I don't yeah. doubt that Eleanor would know how to get Margaret out from under there also, but she's just so distraught. And right. she Edward have just that kind of creative energy right now. He already shows what a great partner he would be. Like, he's just yeah. like, I will pick up the slack. Let me, you know, and. I don't know your family and yet I will totally figure out how to lure this child out in the most generous and thoughtful way. And then, right, that she totally picks up. It's just the most beautiful scene. That is the scene that makes that the payoff later on is that you you understand Eleanor. I mean, it makes, I think, Eleanor's heartbreak in the movie greater than in the book for me, for my experience. Well, you're because right. Their you... partnership is shown so much. Shown so much. Excuse me. Right. Because she's always the one who's just having to put everybody back together right. on her own. Exactly. And to have Edward step in and just just help, just right. lend a hand a little bit in helping care for her family is a yep. beautiful thing. Yep. All right. So yes. So that's that's my that's my other favorite thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> I love that. No, that's good. Um. So yeah, I think I think we've done a lovely job with this amazing movie so good so good so playing good. on stars now yes it is playing on stars right now and mm-hmm. uh you know 
it we like has, them star shows. Right. It has just become comical how many times we end up covering things that are on stars. It's not right? planned. Uh -huh. um, in two weeks, we will be talking about Pride and Prejudice, the book. And then mm -hmm. two weeks after that, we will be talking about the two adaptations that I forget care the years about? of the right yes the two that i care about well <laughs> i think that's completely fair the two I'm, that that right most of popular culture actually so, care about right so mm -hmm. we're going to talk about the i guess it's described in different ways but the easiest way to describe it is the colin firth one Jennifer i forgot e? right i forgot <laughs> i forgot to note what year it is um uh, and the yeah BBC and, nine that's a early 90s also isn't it like 90s? i think it's mid 90s mid 90s yeah wow. okay i think it's mid 90s um and and then we're going to talk about the 2000 and something one. I think it's 2005, the one with Kara Knightley. Knightley. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about those two. Which grows on me, I have to say, every time I watch it. Okay. It's very different. So That's going to be I'm an interesting discussion. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I did not like it at all the first time I saw it. And it continues to grow on me. So There are aspects of it that I love a lot. And there are aspects of it that I don't love. Because yep. it's an adaptation of a beloved book. Yep. Like, I love it for itself very right. much. If it was just a movie, right. I'd be so in. Right, no, exactly. It is a beautiful movie <laughs> right. that I have a few things I don't love yeah. about it as an adaptation. All right, uh -huh. that was preview of that conversation. Woo. Yeah, the Pride and Prejudice book conversation, I think we should be ready to record for a good three hours, huh? That's going to uh, be a long one, I'm thinking. I'm assuming so, so, yeah, you know. we'll do our best. We'll yeah. See. But this was a nice brief little one, so right. that's fine. So be prepared, mm -hmm. people. There's going to be a Buckle lot to up. talk about. Exactly. <laughs> Shorter book. Longer discussion. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so true. <laughs> um, so yeah. So in the meantime, um, leave us reviews. We didn't check if we have any reviews, but we haven't read any in a while. So leave us a review on iTunes. Uh, five stars, always appreciated. But also, mm -hmm. if you read, if you leave us a review with text in it, we will read it here for everyone. That's right. mm -hmm. And I think I, there is one new one. So okay. we'll do that next week. Well, so we'll do that. We'll do that next episode. Mm -hmm. And also uh, become our patron on Patreon. Yes. Just last night, I recorded a solo Q&A, which was delightful and charming and lovely. Also slightly awkward sometimes I think, but I'm def I'm never going to watch it, so I don't know. But don't do that. Yeah, I no. had a lot of fun, and I talked about a lot of Game of Thrones because I had just been at Game yeah. of Thrones, but other things as well. Yeah, and we will be thinking of some new fun things to do for patient exclusives. I was just thinking, Daphne, about you and I doing a commentary on Becoming Jane. <gasps> Wouldn't that be fun for a patron exclusive? Uh, that is going to be a Patreon exclusive. Great. So yes, I we like are going to do. Too. There, Let's do that. there is a lot of there is a lot of content on Patreon that mm -hmm. is just for our patrons, and now we're going to add that. I mean, not immediately, but soon. Right. Um, uh -huh. right. I think, and I also suggested because of Black Sales, I suggested that we do a commentary track for for Muppet Treasure oh. Island. <laughs> I thought you were going to say for an episode of Black Sails, which makes a lot of sense. Oh, no, we're yes, going to, no, we had already too. agreed that we're going to do them for episodes of Black Sails. We'll Good. have to figure out which ones and how we want to do that. Yeah. But I think we also should do Muppet Treasure Island because we don't think we can do Gorgeous. a proper episode on that. But a commentary no. track would be so much it fun. It would be fun. Sure. So, sure. yeah. So stay With the tuned. drinking game for, attached. Of yeah, course. There is going to be, we're going to do some hopefully hilarious uh -huh. new Patreon exclusive episodes. Wonderful. All right. That's patreon.com slash common room radio. Yes, it is. Thanks again so much for listening. Can't wait till next time. I'm Elizabeth Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. Can I just say podcast is a common room radio production. For more information and our other shows, visit commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as $1 a month can make a big difference. Visit patreon.com slash common room radio to pledge support and access bonus features that are just for patrons and join the conversation by using the hashtag. Can I just say and follow us on Twitter at just say podcast. We request that you keep your tweets respectful and positive, and you can always email us at podcast at common Thanks for listening. <laughs>